the purpose of today's lesson is understanding how bubble sort works and perhaps get getting familiar with something called the big O notation as well. We don't necessarily need to understand the big O notation right now, but it's useful to just have a short talk about it. We're also going to be looking at how stack skews and link lists are used in real life. We know how to code it, but what are their actual uses? And then we're going to be looking at the need for files to store data. Everything is good in memory, but we can't use memory all the time because it's volatile. So we need to store stuff in files. And then we're going to be looking at pseudocode to handle text files because that's the one we need to know at AS level. So again, one of those lessons where you might need to do a lot of coding and understanding. Do ask questions if you need to. So let's start with arrays and lists and all of these data structures. All of that are pretty good. They allow us to store information. But as you might have found out, when we're using things like binary search, we need to sort data out in a particular way. And there are a number of ways for us to sort data out. There are lots of different types of algorithms, bubble sort, insertion sort, quick sort, you name it. However, we're going to be looking at bubble sort for today. Now, bubble sort is a simple sorting algorithm that works by repeatedly stepping through the list that needs to be sorted and comparing each pair and swapping them if they're in the wrong order. So all items that you want to sort bubble up in one direction. So if you wanted to do in ascending order, the higher value items go to the right. And if you wanted to do that in descending order, the lower value items go to the right. So bubbles sort themselves out to the top. It's a very slow mechanism of sorting data and it's obviously really used in industry because there are much faster algorithms out there such as quick sort or heap sort. However, for people starting in computer science, it's a very useful way of learning about sorting algorithms. So we're going to be looking at that, not only because it's part of the syllabus, but also because it's a nice, easy way to sort things out. On screen, you'll see the pseudocode for bubble sort, and you've got a list of numbers, 5, 4, 3, 1, 2, and say if you wanted to sort these out in ascending order, you could use this type of uh, algorithm to work it out. So think about the steps. 5 and 4 will need to be compared, and if a 4 is shorter than or lower than 5, it comes out first. The swap that happens. Then 5 and 3 will be compared, then the next set, then the next set, and you keep going back to the beginning, then doing it again, until the list is sorted. So in our pseudocode, we've got the following identifiers. We've got the my list array, we've got the lower and upper bounds, which are basically the first value of the index and the last value of the my list index. We've got the index, which is going to act as our pointer. We've got a swap flag, which tells us whether we need to swap an item or not. We've got top, which is the index of the last element to compare. And we've got a temporary storage location to put the value so we can change things across. So if you think about this, we're going to declare all these identifiers. We're going to set the upper and lower bound to zero. We're going to make sure that the top is equivalent to the upper bound because that's the final item there. And then we're going to use a loop. So in this case, we're going to keep on repeating this until swap is false or we reach top equals zero, which means there's no more top. Now in this loop, we'll have a nested for loop, which starts with index equivalent to lower bound the initial value to top minus one because we don't need to compare the final value because that will be the highest. We're going to set the swap flag initially to false and then we're going to do a basic comparison. If one is greater than the other, then we allocate the value to a temporary variable and then we simply rewrite the values again back to the array. And then we set the swap flag to true and we keep on doing it until we reach the end of the list. Now, we might need to reduce the top variable by one every single time in the loop and the process keeps on repeating until top hits zero. So if the list is already sorted, we'll probably get that done quickly. Otherwise, we just go to every item or every pair in the list. So hopefully you paused the video and you understood that pseudocode. Next up is to learn how to code this in Python. There is a possible implementation on screen. You can pause this and you can code that or you can find alternative examples online. Basically what's happening is that if you've got an array value set of 5, 4 and 2, you'll compare 5 and 4 and then the 5 will probably move to the temporary variable 
and then the 4 will have to be written in index 0 instead of 5 and then you transfer from the temporary variable the value 5 to the first index and that's basically what the principle is of bubble sort and you just keep on repeating it until the list is sorted so the, the use of the temporary variable is crucial in sorting algorithms now do pause the video and do code the bubble sort and see if you can end up with a sorted list now you don't really need to know this until you're 13 but it's quite useful to to know big annotation is a mechanism of comparing different algorithms especially their efficiency and their efficiency is compared based on the worst case scenario so you might have an algorithm that's very quick with a short or small amount of numbers but with a big list it it has an o of n squared so you will give it o n squared as its big o notation that in the worst case scenario this is how it will perform so it kind of gives us a rough indication of how an algorithm performs but it might not give us the ideal information for example if you do have a short list then you might want to use the o n squared algorithm because it's quicker so do pause the video and have a look at the examples and the description of each type of o and do remember that we don't necessarily need to know all of this till year 13 but if you're interested you can start looking it up right now okay so i'm just going to summarize the use of stacks queues and links this just in case um, it's getting a little bit too much stacks normally are used for memory management expression evaluation and backtracking in recursion queues you can use them for management of files sent to a printer buffers especially used with keyboards and scheduling so if you want to kind of schedule alarms tasks all of that could be in a queue and linked lists generally are used for arrays to implement a stack or you can use a linked list to implement a queue you can also use arrays to implement a binary tree all of that is using linked list so the arrays will power the linked list because obviously you're using two one-dimensional arrays and you can use it to implement stack queues and binary trees now programming languages normally have dictionaries and this preset this built into the library but you will need to know how to code these so just make sure that you're familiar with it especially linked list and the possible implementations you don't necessarily need to do scheduling buffers backtracking none of that's necessary uh, at AS level okay so let's start looking at files now and how we use files so we don't always search and organize data in memory because we end up storing the data on on a hard drive or a SSD and this reusable data is eventually written to a file and each file is normally given a name so you'll probably have something like this and the file would normally have an extension which tells you what the file type is so mp3 bmp jpg and so on now for as level we just need to learn how to deal with text files alone text files just contain a sequence of characters they might contain an end of line character and they're basically very easy to read and write to this type of a file because you don't need to do any kind of conversion as well and i think when you go to a2 level the max you're going to be looking at is binary files so dat files dat files that's what you're going to be experimenting with we don't necessarily need to play around with mp3s and jpegs and all of the rest however if you're interested in that you could look things up and you can start exploring how to read and write to those type of files as well so you could take a wav file and convert it to mp3 or you can take a bmp and convert it to jpg so you could look at those type of converters as well a bit advanced for what we need to do but all we need to focus on is text files and that's what we're going to be looking at now okay so start looking at the pseudocode for opening a file a file must be open to either read write or, or append for example if i wanted to open my slim shady.txt file for read i would just write it like that open in uppercase the name of the text file and for read mode and if i want to do write it's exactly the same process but i just right for write in uppercase and in this case everything on the original file is overwritten or if i wanted to append or add data to the end of the file i would use the for append mode which allows me to add data to an existing file so depending on your use 
you can choose one of these three. That's all you need to know for AS level. Now just remember that when you open a file, you need to also close it because if you don't close a file, then you can have issues like security issues or accidentally erase it. The file is open and anyone can get in. So the command to close a file in pseudocode is simply close file in uppercase and you just write the name of the file you want to close afterwards. So pretty straightforward. Another command you need to know is the EOF or the end of file command. And sometimes we need to test for the end of file, perhaps to add a new data item or an append an item towards the end. And if this value returns true, that means we are at the end of the file itself. And in pseudocode, you just simply say EOF and the name of the file. And that's all you need to write. Now you could use this in for loops and repeat until loops or while loops where you can simply say something like for index one to EOF, the name of the file, which basically allows you to check every single record in the file. And that could be used for searching or perhaps sorting uh, as well. Now two other aspects you can play around with files is reading from a file and writing to a file. And these are again pretty straightforward. So once a file is opened in read mode, uh, you can just use the command read file and the name of the file. And then any particular variable you want to get from it has to be written in brackets. And if you want to write something or you want to append something, we write it line by line. So you can use the write file command where you simply have write file in uppercase, the name of the text file, and then whatever you want to write. We normally use a variable to store this data first, but you can also directly put text in. However, the file variable should be the same data type. And I think for text files, it should always be string. You should not be using integer. Otherwise, you can end up with a type mismatch error. Your task is to create a program in Python that allows you to read, overwrite, or append a user input to a file. So a bit of pseudocode on the right-hand side, you can utilize that, or you can code your own. You're free to do both. The identifiers used in this pseudocode are the text line, which is a line of text, and the my file, which is the file name that you want to save your file as. So we're going to declare these as strings. We're going to give a name to the my file variable as mytext.txt. And then we're going to open my file for write mode. We're going to then repeat this until the text line is equivalent to nothing, blank space, to exit the loop. And simply get an input from the user. And if it isn't an empty space, we write to the file. And then otherwise, we close the file. Now, once we've done that, we also want to kind of see if the file is actually stored the information that we've asked it to. So the next part of the code is basically a simple loop to read the file until you reach the end of file. And after that, you have to close it because if we don't close it, we have security issues and all sorts of other things going on. So hopefully the pseudocode makes sense. Pause the video if it doesn't, go through it carefully, and then start working on writing a program in Python. Now on screen is an example of Python code that does this. So do have a look at that if you are stuck or obviously online there are lots of different examples. Just try to keep the examples very simple and don't try to make it overly complicated because if you need to write this in an exam or you need to work on it, you want to make sure that you understand the pseudocode and yet at the same time, the code that you're gonna write is simple enough. So just have a look at the code and see if it makes sense. Pause the video and if you want to code this one, please go ahead and do so. Hopefully by the end of this video, you understand how bubble sort works and you understand big O notation, just a basic information on it that is used to compare algorithms for efficiency and that's all you need to know right now. You should understand the uses of stacks, queues and linked lists. You don't need to know how to implement any of those, but you should be able to understand that. I think I probably might've missed it out in an earlier video so I put it here so just be aware that you can jot those down and then you also should understand how files can be used to write read open close a text file and obviously you should understand what the value of the EOF function is as well so file manipulation especially text file manipulation is very important to understand at AS level so make sure that you do practice and you understand how to use these commands that's it for today's lesson. I'll catch up with you in the next one.